In our wrestling throwback segment this week, we're going to talk about a legend. But it may be a legend that not a lot of people know. One that actually spent time in the ring, but known for, more for what he did behind the scenes, and that would be Jerry Jarrett. Yes, Jerry Jarrett, whose son, Double J, is probably more famous with the generation that we're in right now than his father. But I tell you what, it's kind of interesting the way some of the things are going with his father. He has a, an amazing podcast and just recently started a Roku channel that's focused on Memphis wrestling. And in this throwback segment, we, we've been focusing on Memphis wrestling, and we just wanted to introduce you to Jerry Jarrett. We've been working on this uh, for a while now, and we want to give you some background on Jerry Jarrett. As I mentioned, he is the father of Hall of Famer Jeff Jarrett, and he's the former co-owner of what is known, what was known as Memphis Wrestling Territory. Jerry is a key figure in the history of professional wrestling, wrestling in the Mid-South United States, described as a wrestling genius. He was inducted into the National Wrestling Alliance Hall of Fame in 2009. Jarrett founded Memphis, Tennessee-based Continental Wrestling Association in 1977. In 1989, he merged his promotion with Dallas-based promotion World Class Champion Championship Wrestling, and they created the new United States Wrestling Association, which eventually Jarrett sold to Jerry Lawler in 1977. He made another foray into promoting in 2002 when he co-founded NWA TNA with his son, Jeff Jarrett, selling his controlling interest to Panda Energy International a little bit later. He was exposed to wrestling business at a very early age. His mother worked as a ticket vendor, and he began selling programs for a promotion owned by Roy Welch and Nick Goulas at the age of seven. That's a pretty young start. He be at 14, he became a professional wrestler or professional wrestling promoter, renting buildings, advertising shows, constructing the ring, selling tickets, and stocking refreshments. Those things that promoters in the indie scene do each and every time they are at the arena. He worked as a promoter until he left Nashville to attend college. After college, he worked with Welch and Goulas as an office assistant and became a referee by default after a referee no-showed. Uh, again, something that happens in the indie areas. He soon re returned to promoting, working his way up from local promotions to regional and then national. While working as a referee, Jarrett decided to become a wrestler and was trained by his friend and future tag team partner, Tojo Yamamoto, and veteran, veteran wrestler, Sailor Moran. He wrestled his first match in Haiti in 1965. If you're a fan of Memphis wrestling from back in the day, you know the name Tojo Yamamoto. He became a successful wrestler in the South, particularly in his home state of Tennessee, forming tag teams with Jackie Fargo and once again, Tojo Yamamoto. After a dispute with Goulas in 77, Jarrett opted to break away and found his own, founded his own promotion, CWA, Continental Wrestling Association. He had support of Buddy Fuller, Jerry Lawler, and his mother. Jarrett built the CWA into a successful promotion, staging events each Monday that regularly sold out the Mid-South Coliseum and airing television shows each Saturday morning. In 81, NWA Mid-South Mid-America folded due to competition from CWA with Gulas selling his territory to Jarrett. In 79, the, fa the Freebirds wanted Jarrett to allow them to play Freebird on their entrances. The fir they first tried it at the Mid-South Coliseum, along with twirling the house spotlights. So Jerry Jarrett became one of the first promoters to use music and videos to promote his roster of wrestling. In 1984, Jarrett entered into a talent exchange with Bill Watts' Mid-South Wrestling promotion. 
Jarrett and Lawler advised Watts to bring more young performers into his territory to attract a younger generation of fans, especially females, since they bring their boyfriends to shows. You know, we mentioned earlier that he is a genius. In 88, Jarrett entered talks with Vern Gagne, owner of Memphis or Minneapolis, Minnesota based AWA, the American Wrestling Association, about a potential merger. After the talks were abandoned in 89, Jarrett instead entered into a merger with Dallas, Texas-based promotion World Class Championship Wrestling to create the United States Wrestling Association. The USWA began promoting shows in Tennessee and Texas in 1989, with Jarrett aspiring to take the promotion national. In 1990, WCCW withdrew from the USWA after a revenue dispute, folding shortly thereafter. Unfortunately, as you read these things, you, you hear the the bad side of a business. And unfortunately, that is something that happens in the business. In 92, the USWA began a talent exchange program with the World Wrestling Federation. By the mid-90s, attendance had, at the Mid-South Coliseum had fallen sharply. And in 95, Jarrett sold his stake in the promotion to Jerry Lawler, and Larry Burton. After stepping back, Jarrett worked as a consultant for both WCW and WWF. 2001, Jarrett put together proposals for ac the acquisition of WCW, circulating that he could return the company to profitability by aggressively cutting costs. The company's assets were, however, acquired by the WWF after its programming on TBS and TV. NT was canceled. After the sale of WCW to the WWE, WWF at that time, and the bankruptcy of Extreme Championship Wrestling, as they were much better known as ECW, the North American wrestling profession industry lacked anything that was even viably close to being competition to the WWE. Jerry and Jeff Jarrett then decided to fill that void with NWA TNA. They formed J Sports and Entertainment, and they were the parent company of NWA TNA. They began airing weekly pay-per-views on In Demand in June of 2002. In October that same year, JSE sold 72% controlling interest in TNA to Panda Energy. Jarrett remained part of the NWA management team until parting and departing in late 2005 over a dispute about the direction of the country. Jerry Jarrett now hosts the podcast Booking Memphis and now, as I mentioned earlier, has a Roku channel. And if you get the chance especially if you are an old time Memphis wrestling fan, you're going to see things that just stoke memories of the, the distant past. But if you're not from that era, it's fun to go back. I watched a, uh, a video on Jarrett's Roku channel. That was the moon dogs and the fabulous ones, Stan Lane, Steve Kern. The, the whole ring had blood on it. There was blood everywhere. They used tables. They used microphone stands. They used cords. They used the ring bell. And it went forever and ever and ever. It was, it was the epitome of old school wrestling. And it was awesome. And you can get all, you know, all through the um, archive there of wrestling from back in the Memphis days. It's been a pleasure talking about Jerry Jarrett with you. Uh, hope that you get to know him through his podcast. We encourage you to go there through his Roku channel, and we'll keep promoting Memphis wrestling from back in the day right here on the Wrestling News Blog official podcast.